come on. Okay. I know you're looking at the patent and how a patent is applied, correct? But I want to know why the basic idea, and I'm sure you're already past this, but I don't understand why, if Peter's land is being contaminated by something that he didn't want, it's not considered something that the company has to pay at their expense to get rid of because he didn't want it in the first place, which I think is arguably, you know, my naive knowledge, would be pretty much universal in every other take on that, no matter what it may be, patent or otherwise. Yep. That's a very good question, and you're raising a super good point. And in Canada, it was clarified when a farmer in Saskatchewan got contaminated in uh, 1998 with uh, canola, on his conventional canola, and his name is Percy Schmeiser, and uh, their farmer um, did not bend down, and he actually went through. Can you hear me? Yeah, maybe just put it up to your mouth a little bit. Uh, it was, uh, what happened in Canada, a farmer was uh, prosecuted for having uh, infringed on Monsanto's patent, and it went to court and it ended up going to Supreme Court and the court clearly defined how the law would apply and what it said was it did not matter how the genes got to Percy Schmeiser's field what mattered was that he had Monsanto's gene on his field in the canola crop and because of it he owed his profits to them so that actually just defined how the law applied, and that's why I refer to this dumb bull story, when in my bull breeds yeah. a neighbor's cow, that I, I own that calf that cow will produce. And uh, so that is how that is defined, and those are the grounds under which, now Monsanto, for example, as a company, can pursue, like it's yeah. almost... How it's, come that hasn't been appealed? Because that would be like at the right at the point at the beginning when someone said, and come on, let's face it, they got paid off. So, why isn't that being attacked and appealed in the first place? So that's backed off. Because uh, I, I would call our government, they're corporate prostitutes, and uh, they have not been, uh, they have not uh, made the rules and regulations, which uh, I personally would say, if Monsanto is allowed to release uh, those uh, genetic constructs into the environment and you have to sign a technical use agreement as a farmer to hold those constructs on a certain piece of land then Monsanto or the company holding the genetic modification should be uh, held accountable for retaining that construct to that property but uh, that is actually the absolute that's actually the amazing part which is totally over Seen, and that is why it is so beautiful for them that eventually they actually they actually take every acre they will actually go towards their work because through their doings they are cornering the complete market and they will contaminate everyone and they'll actually own all the seeds and they can actually determine which farmer is going to plant and who is never going to get any seed anymore because he has not followed their rules, and they can actually allocate acres to different people at their pleasure. It actually gives complete control over the seed and the food, and what the food contains to those corporations who hold those patents. Again, why I don't understand that has not been appealed right from the beginning. Because that's just not human. Actually, uh, our court case, first of all, very interesting tonight, this uh, gene patenting on the ovarian and breast cancer success is actually the reason why we were launching this case because through the success to uh, through this court case there was optimism that we could actually pursue some of those plant patent genes and uh, that's very interesting that we are sitting in the same room with people who have knowledge and are working on that here and um, if we win our case that actually also opens the door that a farmer now would be able to sue Monsanto for contaminating us. And that will reverse it. And that is actually why this court case is also very important for us. Well, that should be normal in the first place. Thanks, Rita. I'll leave that one. Has it, has, who in the room has heard of um, Steve Marshall? Yeah, that's not too bad. 
but we need more. We need a lot more people. Every time, every time you open your pantry, Steve Marsh is coming out because he's the Percy Schmeisser that Peter's talking about. He's the Percy Schmeisser in Western Australia that 001% of Australians know about. We need to inform ourselves. Go home tonight, look up Steve Marsh on your search engine and find out about him and support him. Send him money, send him support because we need that awareness and we need it here in Australia. And we've got the goodwill of Peter here uh, bringing his information as well. Thanks, Costa. I wasn't going to talk about the, the uh, I was going to direct a question to Peter Cashman, which has to do more to do with the law, which is probably a bit strange, but I'll just, one thing you said though, Peter, you said that because Monsanto's genes have invaded Percy's or Steve's uh, property, they are, it's, it's his profits, but his profits have been diminished because of the invasion of the genes. Especially Steve's, because Steve was an organic farmer. So how can they, how can they plead that? Peter Cashman could probably ask that too. The second question I'd like to ask, and this is totally over and above what we're talking about, it seems to me that more and more the law is about corporations taking on individuals. And corporations can keep fighting and they can keep spending till they screw us. Is, can anything be done about that? Or is that beyond the capacity of the law to deal with this, this thing? They have more money than we do. Just to answer that last question and hand it over to, to, to the Peters. Look, yes, the, there is a, there's supposed to be a government, you see, and the government <laughs> the government the government's supposed to have the ACCC or uh, other organisations like IP Australia, which are there supposedly to actually act on our behalf. The problem is that have you heard of, have you heard of the revolving door? Mm. Right, it's called. I'm a public servant and I earn $80,000 a year, but if I go work for Pfizer or Monsanto, I could be on $300,000 a year. Now, guess what? I'd like to earn $300,000 a year. Who wouldn't? And I'm not suggesting that all of the public servants are in this camp, but the fact of the matter is we have no system in place. We have no check and balance to ensure that the revolving door doesn't actually influence the decision that our public servants make. Now, right now, the, the, the Gene Payton bill is a perfect example of how the revolving door works. Here is, a, here is a bill which is actually trying to bring some calibration into the patent system. And yet IP Australia got together with Ausbiotech, with the Institute of Patent Attorneys, with BioUSA, and with a plethora of other organisations to actually oppose the bill. Why? Were they embarrassed that perhaps they'd got it wrong for 30 years? Or was it that they were actually protecting the people who they think are going to provide them with money? And one of the most interesting things is that IP Australia earns all of its revenue through patent filing fees, patent renewal fees. Right? All of their money, all of their operating money comes from the patent system. Is it any wonder then that they're in the business of granting more and more patents. So to answer your question, yes, there should be, but the problem is our federal system and our state system is failing us because it's failing to provide the necessary checks and balances. Sorry, um, I had a supplementary question to Professor Cashman. Uh, is, there any, is there any recourse under Australian law for organic farmers whose crops are contaminated by, I prefer to use the word, genetically engineered crops rather than the spin doctor genetically modified crops? The short answer is yes, um, but there's a bit of a dilemma. Monsanto would have you believe that contaminating your land is going to improve your profitability <laughs> and productivity and increase your profits. Certainly under most laws, including Australia, if you um, create a nuisance or cause loss or injury to someone, that's usually compensable. But the $64 question in these cases is often, does this so-called contamination in fact cause harm in an economically calculable sense, or does it cause an improvement in your crops or whatever it is that's being genetically modified? And the Monsanto argument, as I understand, and I, I know a little bit about gene patterns, I'm not an expert in agricultural patterns, 
I sincerely argue in part runs to the effect that you're getting the benefit of this genetic modification and there really isn't any quantifiable loss in economic terms that would entitle you to sue for compensation. If someone unleashes something that destroys your land, destroys your crops, renders your farm uh, uneconomic, then under ordinary tort principles you'd be entitled to sue them and recover for that loss or damage. Yeah. But it becomes more problematic when you debate what the effect of genetically modified products is. And of course the company motto or mantra is th these are all improvements for the betterment of humankind. It will improve profitability, it will improve crop growth, it will improve whatever it is you're concerned to genetically modify. And that I think is a $64 question, particularly given that very few of these gen genetically modified products are adequately researched in terms of their long-term health effects, for example, leaving aside their short-term economic effects. But just in the case of Steve Marsh, sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Steve Marsh lost his, he lost his organic certification, which is his, his income, because of the, because of, and that's quite patently, patently, sorry, that is quite patently uh, a, a problem caused by Monsanto. I mean, I don't see how it could possibly be anything else. So he lost the organic premium that he was getting for his crops. Well, that's, well, that's because we know that genetic material is transferred by bees and wind and things like that. So, yes, I know, I know. And there is no, and, and, and that's why he's testing the law, because there is actually no clear uh, path for him. I mean, it's the, the legal community is divided as to whether or not he'll be successful in claiming damages against, the, against his neighbour. Monsanto are keeping quite clear of it, understandably, but, you know, this man is basically having to fork it all up out of his own pocket, except unless people help him, to test the law. Is that fair? I don't think so. And the thing is, Peter, that their claims... Monsanto are making claims about their product. Tests yeah. are coming out now that are proving that, you know, the wonder golden rice and the wonder products, it's, yeah, um, if you didn't hear that, it started with B and ended in T and had plenty of good manure in the middle from PP. But that's what the claims are and they're now starting to, to be proven. My name is uh, Eric Dari. I'm from uh, Greenpeace in, in Canada, so I'm very pleased to, to see us. Canadian farmers there as well. Uh, just one comment on the revolving doors. Uh, we had just a case recently in Canada of the director of a biotechnology office of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. His name is Stephen Yarrow, who's been working for the federal government to take care of us in terms of biotechnology. Guess for whom he's working now? He's working for Monsanto. So as a concrete example of this revolving door. My question to you, and actually to the three of you there, what would be a, an adequate uh, farmer protection legislation to prevent that kind of abuse? Because uh, you raised some of the questions, I think, about the organic sector. What would be something which would have teeth in terms of legally uh, to, uh, to make it happen and to prevent farmers having to, to go to courts to, to, to carry on what they've been doing for a few thousand years? Well, I have, uh, this morning we had a meeting and uh, I asked uh, my friend if I could borrow a cigarette from him and have a smoke and I would actually like you to ask if, uh, if you allow me to smoke here. Is it allowed uh, in this room? Yeah. Oh, it's not? <laughs> and, um, I'll join you after. <laughs> okay. Um, the reason why I'm asking is we have established that uh, in society the last few years that smoking, secondhand smoke is harmful to society. And so people have to stand outside and smoke. We can't smoke in bars in certain places anymore. And uh, then all of a sudden we uh, let uh, genetic constructs out in an environment. As scientists know that the threat to humankind on Earth is the loss of biodiversity, we are in introducing genetic constructs into an environment where we have no long-term uh, research whatsoever. And uh, I always question which person can actually make the decision to let something like that go, where we know there could be horizontal gene transfer into other species and other organisms like it's incredible actually but if the law does provide genetic organi uh, organisms to be uh, released in the environment then I would also say if somebody can have a patent on it then that patent holder should also be held liable to retain that construct onto the land which 
the farmer has to sign the technical use agreement and he should not have any rights to or have no, he should be prohibited by law <clears throat> to contaminate his neighbor, no different than I'm prohibited to have a cigarette in this room and contaminate you with my smoke. And that's how I view that. Can I just add this observation? I, I think historically our law has been quite good at protecting uh, the overexpansion of the patent system, and Canada is a really good example. The Canadian Supreme Court invalidated a patent in relation to an onco mouse that had been patented by Harvard and was the subject of patents in many other jurisdictions. The Canadian Supreme Court said, no, we're not going to allow the patenting of a higher life form. And the Canadian courts also refused to allow a patent for a genetically modified soybean at a time when it was sought to be patented under the same laws that we have now. It was considered to be uh, a product of nature and not an invention. What was the legislative response to that in Canada? Special legislation was passed to permit the patenting of these things. And that's the problem. Governments have been persuaded that by the biotech industry that it's a really good thing to encourage patentability of genetic discoveries and modifications. In the area of human patents, it was premised on the assumption that once you found a genetic mutation associated with the disease, the next step would be the discovery of a cure or a method of genetic intervention to prevent or treat the disease. The problem is that step has never occurred, by and large. I mean, there are some genetically modified conditions that are, are, are medically, um, where med medicine can intervene. But by and large, most of these patents were granted in a climate where it was assumed that science, science was on the verge of discovering solutions to these genetic mutations that were associated with disease. And that promise simply hasn't been lived up to, but was still caught in the assumption that patentability is good because it encourages research uh, biotechnology is good for the business, for the, for the economy, and people have lost sight of some of the fundamental problems that this um, mythology has created. Look, to answer your question in terms of what can be done, look, a number of things have been suggested over the time, but it all, look, it boils down to creating a balance in terms of the IP system and creating a policy that actually is fair and balanced. At the moment, it's all one-sided. It's all, we need patents, and the more patents we have, the greater there will be technological progress and so forth and so forth. We know that's not true, ladies and gentlemen, because look what's happening with the pharmaceutical industry. Right here and now, I mean, uh, AstraZeneca just announced uh, it's going to sack 7,300 people because apparently a lot of its patents are drying up. We now have the strongest patent laws we've ever had in the world. And, and the fact is, that the number of new drugs in the drug development pipeline are dropping off rapidly. So if patents meant more drugs, or if patents meant more inventions, or if it actually resulted in more innovation, you would think the converse would be true. You would think that we'd have a plethora of new drugs out there, but it's not happening. So we know it's a lie, but the fact of the matter is, the biotechnology industry, the pharmaceutical industry, which are in cahoots together, and the chemical companies, which, by the way, sell the pesticides that actually uh, go into the GM crops, etc., etc. They can afford to spend a lot of money on lobbyists. Now, you would be surprised, would you not, that in, in Washington there are two lobbyists for every congressman that are paid for by the pharmaceutical company. What are they there to do? They are there to protect the interests of the pharmaceutical industry, and so forth and so forth. And I mean, when I say that, I mean the whole bunch of, the whole lot of them. So our politicians react. They react to constant niggling. And so that's why they have these lobbyists in there, out there. So this is the big problem that we have. Now, what do we do about it? Well, we try and motivate the community to go out there and tell tell the politicians that we need balance in our system. Now, in the Schmeiser case, look, all he did was, all Percy Schmeiser did was, he is that he basically collected the seed of these GM canola, right? And he saved the seed. And when he saved enough of the seed, he basically planted a crop. Well, that was the end of the world for Monsanto. He saved seed and he planted a crop without a license from Monsanto. How dare he breach their intellectual property? Well, it's actually an infringement to not only do such a thing, but to actually have it in your possession, right? 
Now, so he was sued successfully and the Canadian Supreme Court basically said he was guilty of infringement. So I, I have to say, I beg to differ a little bit with Peter on the sensibilities of the Canadian Supreme Court, but they said he was guilty of infringement, even though he did nothing more than save the seed that came onto his property without even him asking for it, okay? Now, the thing in terms of Steve Marsh is that there's no law, again, to balance the the injustice that has been perpetrated on him. He can't actually go to his neighbour with an ironclad guarantee and say, right, you've, your, your stuff has come onto my property. I'm now going to be deprived of organic certification. Therefore, pay me X. There's no system. So as a result, there's no balance. There's, and that's the problem. We need, to answer your question, we need a balanced system. Nicole. Thanks, Costa. Costa. Um, this is just taking a step off because I'm not familiar with all the law, all the laws and the technicalities that are. But the Rio Summit in 1992, which I believe Australia is a signatory to, has enshrined in law, in our federal law, the um, concept of the precautionary principle which states that if something is dangerous and irreversible, then it is not implemented. This is irreversible, obviously. Um, do we actually... Is it a technicality? Is the law the technicality? Why can't we go up to that higher level of just the fact that it's dangerous and irreversible and that's, in, and that's a, um, a enshrined in Australian law? Understanding. I do understand what the <coughs> what the, what do you call it um, the precautionary principle. I do understand it, and I use something similar on my farm. Uh, we call that the testing guidelines. But um, uh, one thing which uh, I know in America, in the United States, and for countries who have adopted genetically modified constructs on and to be released in the environment is uh, there's a problem with the revolving door and the legislation which was written to uh, safely introduce genetically modified organisms into the environment it was a wish list of the chemical corporations and patent holders and uh, in um, and then they all even got a better wish they actually created a p position in the FDA and they put a lawyer in there which initially actually asked the chemical companies to write it up but they wanted to implement, and they got a key issue in there, and that's what's called uh, substantial, substantial equivalency. When it does look like canola, it got to be canola, and we do not have to safety test whether it is actually the same stuff. And that was very uh, key to, <clears throat> to their legislation, because if they ever, ever had to look into it, really what it is, it probably would not have not gone into the open environment. And uh, if Australia is using the precautionary principle, then I would assume these constructs could not be released in this country because it should be discovered that, that there's some uh, very uh, unknown issues here and they need to first be clarified or they cannot be clarified and the technology just has to be abandoned. The precautionary principles are applied depending on which side it, the issues are being determined. For instance, uh, biologic medicines, for instance, a, a protein that exists in the human body, Amgen, the world's largest biotechnology company, had 22 years in Australia of patent protection over erythropoietin. It's exactly the same protein that exists in our human body. It's mimicked by a biological process that manufactures this. It's exactly the same. Everybody knows it's exactly the same. Well, when that patent came off in 2006, it's now 2012, do you think there's a generic version of erythropoietin available on the market in Australia? No. Why? Why? Oh, because, because, because the TGA gets wobbly at the knees when they think that perhaps they might have to approve a medicine and say that this is completely 100% substitutable. For God's sake, it's erythropoietin. It's a human protein. Right? But they will not grant substitutability because of the precautionary principle, because they're, they're worried that there might be some unintended reaction. But when it comes to seeds and things like that, well, there's no problem there. We'll allow, you know, wheat, GM wheat trials, because that's fine. Depends on whose side 
is involved, okay? Um, I've got a question really in two parts. The first part is, Peter, when you talked about the case you're taking uh, in the US against Monsanto, you went through a number of criteria a patent has got to um, con conform to, one of which was you can't patent something which is going to do damage, I think, or words to that effect. My first question goes to um, the, the possibility that if I can patent a, uh, a test for uh, breast cancer and in selling it cause damage if you can't afford it, I mean, is there any flow-on effect of what is understood by doing damage, that is, excluding people from access to a test because I own the patent and they can't afford it? And the second question was, um, and again, Peter, you make the point, in Canada there's almost no such thing as non-GM canola. The entire Canadian crop of canola is contaminated with GM food. I've never seen a, a, a material that is more anti-competitive than genetically modified crops. And I'm wondering if anyone has considered taking to the ACCC the anti-competitive nature of these crops. Julie, Peter's asked me to answer some of that question, some of your question, so I'll, I'll attempt to answer the, the first. Um, yeah. Um, look, basically a patent owner can do whatever a patent owner likes. There's no, there's no longer any, any uh, policy restriction on a patent owner working or not working their invention. Um, they don't have to take into account how their invention is going to impact on the rest of society. So if they want to max out the price, it's a supply and demand thing. If they've got something that is very difficult to substitute, and basically we know that human genes, well, there's, that, you know, there's only one set of genetic mutations, for, for instance, and if you've got a patent on all of those, well, that's it, you've got the market. So you can charge whatever you like. And that's what, exactly what Myriad has done in the United States. And it's costing a, a thousands, I think it costs a woman $4,000 for a full, a full BC, BRCA1 and 2 screening, okay? And that's just the way it is. Um, uh, there used to be provisions many years ago, before trips, before the World Trade Organization, um, there would be certain let out clauses. Um, and in fact, actually, there, there is a let out clause in our Patents Act. It's called Section 163. It means the Crown has the right to essentially use a patent for its own services. It can't do it without due compensation and so forth, but they have the right to do that. The problem is the politicians go weak at the knees at the <coughs> thought that they might do something like this because that could be interfering with an intellectual property right and then they might get sued. Now, what's happened with the plain tobacco packaging legislation, everyone? What's happening? Well. We all know why the government passed that legislation. It's because we now know that smoking and cancer are linked together. And the government tried to, is trying to stop that. But you see, British American tobacco don't like that. They see that as an interference with an intellectual property right. And they're now suing the Australian government, that's us, for damages because the government's dared to pass a law that interferes with their intellectual property. So the problem we have today, Julie, is that if the government was to exercise its crown use rights or introduce a law which creates some sort of balance in the system, they might get sued for interfering with an intellectual property right. This is the world we now live in. This is, the, this is it. So we've got to change it, otherwise we will not have a balance. There's maybe one more part on this. If you are referring to our court case, uh, it is clearly established in American law that in 1817 uh, a, a judge clarified that you can't obtain a patent on something which is harmful or poisonous to society. And we, uh, in our court case, even on the initial launch, we already have a number of cases of studies which uh, will verify that uh, genetically modified food or <clears throat> plants and also the chemicals used in the process and that is namely Roundup is uh, harmful and poisonous to society and any and every study anybody ever has or knows about we would like to have it and it will be presented in the court that we will prove that this whole idea is actually invalid and um, 
the whole idea between the unpatenting these plants that Ray Monsanto does, for example, at this point is to extend the patent on a very successful chemical they have had for since 1974, and they're trying to extend patent on the chemical through patents on the plants, and that's actually the large part of this idea, and that is also to ensure this corporation profits, and the corporation actually did go and see uh, the consulting company of Arthur Anderson a number of years ago because they were tired of having to compete in the marketplace all the time. And Arthur Anderson worked out a plan for them how they could actually operate this and they said, okay, just get a hold of all the seats in the world and then you will not have any more competitive fears to worry about. Um, my question was, I guess, originally an echo of that, but I guess following on from um, the question of whether or not you can fight these um, patent decisions based on evidence of harm, could it be that um, what happens in this situation is very similar to what happened in um, terms of the tobacco movement, anti-tobacco movement, that as evidence of harm is demonstrated over time through successive research studies, perhaps, um, and public sentiment against the use of GM products based on this evidence of harm, could that start to turn the tables? I mean, is that an optimistic possibility? If I can say something about it. I, uh, in North America, we have no labeling. And it appears like in jurisdictions where labeling is permitted and uh, you have labeling whether something contains GM or not con GM, and you have a relatively uh, educated public, then um, you automatically sort that out because farmers can't really possibly sell their product in those marketplaces. But in North America, there have been several attempts of labeling being made, and they were always deliberately destroyed because they don't want labeling and it's not supposed to be. There's actually 15 states in the United States currently which prohibit labeling. You cannot actually see anything against GM products. They had tried this years ago already with that uh, HBR, like with the uh, hormones they used in their dairy cows. And um, <clears throat> so that is how, how it's currently in the United States. So uh, that is part of the problem. If the consumer will be informed and not buy the product, that will die tomorrow. So it is up to all of us actually to make that decision not to buy that anymore. And time is kind of working maybe for us, but this contamination of GM onto organic farms, for example, they probably just rub their hand and must just be laughing because uh, <clears throat> It is prohibited on organic farms, but it will also prohibit to have uh, uncontaminated food for those people who really desi desire to have that, and that's actually incredible. There are two things that are most important in this world, other than defense, and a roof over your head. And that is food, a full belly, and medicines when you get sick. And there are companies out there who are now using the patent system to control medicines and control food. And they're going to use genes in order to do both. Okay? And genes are something they didn't invent, but they're using the gene system. There's a company now, right now called EvoGene. It's an Israeli company, and it's in bed with Monsanto now. Their objective is to patent just about every genetic trait that exists in a plant that has been identified and linked to climate change. Why? Because they want to basically get into bed with Monsanto to create genetically modified crops that somehow will survive in high salinity situations or with low nutrition or with low rainfall. Why? Because they want to control food production. Why? Because without food, you're going to die. Now that's what it all gets down to. At the end of the day, there's no real net benefit in any of this. I mean, we have survived on this planet for thousands of years with farmers basically developing crops successfully, sharing their seeds. We, you know, having a vast variety of different, different foods to eat. You go to Peru and, and potatoes are everywhere. How many potatoes do you buy when you go to the supermarket? How many, what choice do you get? If you're lucky, yeah. Well, 
What did we learn from Ireland in the potato famine? Where, where is this taking us all? And for what and whose benefit? That this, these are the big questions that we've got to answer. And the thing is, the patent system, unfortunately, is being used in order to achieve a very negative conclusion. We've got to stop it. So we've got two more questions. But just on that topic, on that topic, I wanted to, to say something. Okay, Peter's given us one piece of direct action, which is make labelling your business. That is something we can all take home tonight. Make it your business. Look at labels. If the information is not there, don't buy it. I want. That's what I want. I don't want to go home tonight and have a sore neck from all the whip back moments of like, oh my god, revolving doors and cows jumping fences and leaving things for other cows and frames and all that. That's important and, and legally we need to understand and be aware of this. But this is one big point, labelling. Luigi, what's another simple take home one? Simple. What? Everyone's here, everyone down that barrel of that camera. Pick up the telephone and tell your parliamentarian they should be supporting the Patent Amendment, Human Genes and Biological Materials Act. We'll do the hard work for you, but you've got to support it. And communicate that to your parliamentarians. And, uh, do you have a... no, I, mean, I, I think that consumer concern is, is critical because government is only hearing the voice of industry, by and large, on many of these issues. And the consumer movement isn't as organised, and the environmental movement, although organised, probably doesn't attract as much political interest as maybe it should, but uh, far be it for me to give you advice on politics, I'm just a lawyer. <laughs> 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 can, can you spell this out aloud for me? N-I-G-G-I-E. Oh, sorry. Oh, L-E. N-I-G-G-L-E. <laughs> Um, I'm just wondering um, um, around our, you know, the ho it's an integrated system. So what Steve Marsh has lost is his right to have a different system of agriculture. So to what extent is competition law being applied in some of these scenarios? Um, and the second question I have, which is a sort of a more strategic question, is. Um, if the gene, uh, the, sorry, the patent system is not appropriate and it's out of control, what is the appropriate system for protection of discovery so that companies can get a return on investment for the research that they do that is not going to impede competition in the future? I'll, ask this, I'll answer the second question, and then Peter can answer the first question, which is on... Is that all right? <laughs> um, Excuse me, the <laughs> Well, that's all right. You're a professor. <laughs> but look, um, you know, this idea that we need to reward people for making breakthroughs, gee whiz, what happened? How did we get here before the patent system? You know? Was it a? Did, how did we innovate before the patent system? We innovated because necessity is the mother of invention. Everyone, you know, we don't need a patent system to actually encourage you to innovate. And the patent system, by the way, was never in, created for the purposes of encouraging innovation. It actually goes right back to the uh, 1500s and earlier, and it was about controlling the movement of labour. You know, the Venetians basically didn't want their technology about how to make mirrors go off to France. And so they use the patent system in ways to, in, to encourage their tradesmen and their, and their craftsmen and their guilds to stay within their jurisdictions. And it really evo evolved out of that. Do you know you could only get a patent for 14 years under English law until 1919? From 1623 until 1919, it was 14 years. And then it went to 16 years in 1919, and then suddenly it became 20 years in, to, in 1995. Now, why? You know, it, you know, it, you know wh wh what's the point of that? You know, is it going to be 25 years next and 50 years after that? And really, do, if we add more and more time, are we going to encourage more and more innovation? No. So, to answer your question, we basically have no 
economic, economic evidence to support the assumption, and that's all it is, that the patent system provides an incentive to innovate. And many economists have said that. Okay. I didn't answer your question. I'm, so no, I think it was a good answer. answer. I'm becoming a politician, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> no, what's the alternative? It's my, it's my okay. Yeah. What's the alternative? The alternative is, if we're going to have a system of, if we're going to have a patent system, then let's. I know, but if we're going to have that, we already have it. Then let's apply it to what it really. Let's apply it to it strictly. If you have an invention, you can get a patent on that. But if you discover a gene that's linked to, to breast cancer or whatever it might be, you don't get it. You don't get a patent on that. The other thing is, let's have social modifiers within the patent system, so that in certain circumstances, where necessary, and I think the growing of food is one of those sets of circumstances, that the system provides a check and balance, which takes into account the interests of growers as well as those that innovate. I, I think the short answer to your first question is that patent law trumps competition law. The whole purpose of the patent system is to give someone a statutory monopoly, and therefore competition law simply doesn't have any application. On the second question, can I just make two further comments? I think part of the problem, and Luigi has adverted to this, is evident from the fact that the patent office historically, particularly in the United States and here, has seen its role as to help patentees get patents. In fact, the motto of the US Patent Office for many years was, how can we help our customers get more patents? That was the regulatory framework. It really wasn't a truly independent, critical process. And that's part of the problem. We need a regulatory system that's independent and critical, not trying to serve the interests of the business community. Secondly, a lot of these are very vexed policy questions. They're not legal questions. And therefore, we need to have a, a, a more balanced and more informed policy debate and governments need to be less amenable to influence from big business. If you can solve that problem, we'll make some progress. Uh, actually, you're not supposed to obtain a patent. That's against the law to obtain a patent to get a monopoly. But I think the initial intent of a patent was if you invented a plowshare and you spent quite a bit of money to do it, you had a little bit of time to recover some of the development costs and then the other people could also start manufacturing that plowshare later and that would uh, bring down the price, but I think that was a real intent and you could probably see a plowshare if you actually had a significantly different plowshare than what we had before. And now we have uh, these uh, patents granted on these organisms and things and we don't really can't see it and it's very difficult to grapple with. So I assume the patent uh, regulation is totally behind the technology, like behind in. So. Um, in Canada, we used to have a public uh, plant breeding program done through Agriculture Canada. And I came as a farmer from Germany, and we didn't have that, those things in Germany. And I think it served Canada extremely well, those programs. And it, it provided access. We could buy certified seed. We can multiply it. We didn't have to pay anybody for the multiplication. We could sell it to our neighbors. Also, without any implications, we didn't owe anyone any money and it was in the public interest and in the interest of the Canadian government that we actually had good varieties on our farm which were good in the marketplace and they provided services to society and also a very exportable crop. So we had actually a very good system, so why can't we have that? And there were no patents on those constructs and uh, the varieties and things have served society very, very well. So. We have it, and it's all possible, so why don't we go back to it? Okay. Oh, look, why would I want to be at home when I'm just around this information? Thank you, gents. This is our last question. <laughs> Even though there's, there's frustration in the back of the room. Frustration! Which is questions. <laughs> Thank you. Look, I, I'm, this is going to be really quick, because Thank I you. do understand. Look, I'm a farmer and a woman with breast cancer, so I feel I've got, a, I've got an interest in... in Yep. I feel I have an interest in both these things, but perhaps more in the breast cancer area. So I particularly want to thank both Luigi and Professor Cashman for taking this on. Um, I'm also a member of the Consumer Group Cancer Voices Australia, to whom I introduced you a couple of years ago. Um, I wish you the very best, because I think what we might be able to do here in Australia may be something that will actually strike. <coughs> 
quite a strong blow internationally. Uh, one other very small point was about if we didn't have patents on genes, wouldn't research actually be able to increase progress much more quickly? And, and even I mean, people with cancer and other similar diseases are really looking for something which will enable personalized medicine so that <clears throat> we find out what our gene problems are, we can do something about it. I mean, it's one of the most wonderful things, even if it isn't progressing very fast at the moment, perhaps if you guys win the day for us, it will. Thank you. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I've got the task of saying that we have to uh, pick up my stumps and, uh, and go home. Um, but before I do that, if you could all please thank our three wonderful speakers, Peter, <laughs> Luke, 